Good morning. Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. It's the Lord's Day, August 29th, 2021. Please join us in the worship of God and in the study of His Word. God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge that you are a holy God and that you reign over the whole earth. Help us to exalt you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's all sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. first reading for this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, and I will be reading Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. The king in his might loves justice, you have established equity you have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our gospel hymn this morning is, He Brought Me Out of the Miry Clay. My heart was distressed beneath Jehovah's red crown, and lo, in the pit where my sins dragged me down, I cried to the Lord from the deep miry clay, who tenderly brought me out to golden day. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. Peace be 
upon the strong rock by his side. My steps were established, and here I'll abide. No danger of falling, where here I remain. But stand by his grace until the crown I gain. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. song of praise, hallelujah. He gave me a song, t'was a new song of praise. By day and by night, these sweet notes I will raise. My heart's overflowing, I'm happy and free. I'll praise my Redeemer who has rescued His wonderful mercy to me. I'll praise Him till all men His goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad. Till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. Our second reading for this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 10 through 16. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The contemporary song that we're going to sing is Build My Life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you. Only there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will Okay, kids, it's now your part of the service. Get ready to sing a song and hear a story. I love you, Lord, and I live my Lord to work. Join my King in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Join my King in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Thank you, Andrew, Sylvie, and Malcolm. Good morning, children. When baby Moses was born, his sister Miriam was about five years old, and his brother Aaron was about three. 
Moses' family all trusted in God so that they were able to keep him hidden for three months. Then they had to find a way to save him as there was a bad law in Egypt that said all Hebrew baby boys had to die. Moses' mother made him a little basket to lay in and she hid him in the river in between the bulrushes. She had Miriam hide and watch what would happen. A princess came along and decided to save this baby and keep him. Miriam was very brave and spoke to the princess, offering to find a woman to care for him while he was really little for her. The princess agreed, and so Moses' mother raised him until he was older, and then he went to live in the palace as a prince. Moses stayed there until he was a man, and then God used him to save his people. Even though Miriam was a very little girl, God used her to save her brother, and there are many stories about Miriam in the Bible. She loved God her whole life and became a leader to her people. Little children, you can be used of God to bless others too. Trust in Him, pray and learn Bible verses. Then every chance you get, be ready to help others and do good. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for Miriam. From the time she was very little, she trusted in you, obeyed her parents, and served others her whole life. Help the children to trust in you, to obey their parents, and to be quick to see chances to serve others and to be helpful. Please help all of us to do the same. We pray especially for those with names beginning with A, B, or C. In Jesus' name, Amen. Heavenly Father, We have failed to live up to your standard of righteousness. And so we come before you this morning, not in our righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We confess our sins of thought and word and deed. For these sins we ask your forgiveness. We thank you that you grant us forgiveness in the name of Jesus who died for us. Thank you that you are pleased to use us as servants, Thank you that you have chosen us to represent you to the world, to show the world what kindness looks like, what love looks like, and what righteousness looks like, to show the world your character. In a world that is confused about right and wrong, help us to know clearly what is right. We know that there are believers who have become confused by church leaders who have embraced the world's philosophy rather than the teaching of Scripture. We pray that you would convict those church leaders. We pray that you would lead those believers into the truth of your word. We need your word in our lives. We need your word to understand you better. We need your word to understand what Jesus has done for us. We need your word to know how you want us to think and speak and live. We ask that by your spirit you would teach us and we ask by your Spirit that you would enable us to live what we have learned. We thank you for your grace and mercy upon us during this pandemic. We ask that you would give our leadership wisdom as we discuss when we should reopen our building for services. We pray for those who have health problems. Many of us need strength to endure pain or suffering. Many of us need medical attention when it's hard to come by. Many of us need emotional and spiritual encouragement at a difficult time in our lives. We ask for your help. We also pray for those with practical needs, especially employment or housing. We pray for our students as they apply for status in Canada. We pray for those who are spreading the good news, the gospel, in this city, in this province, and in this country. We pray for those we send out to minister in other countries and among other peoples. We ask that your word would have great effect and that many would trust Jesus as Savior and worship him as Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After my message last week, I received a comment that there was lots of meat in it. Indeed, it seemed to me that Peter expressed many thoughts and ideas in those first nine verses concepts which could almost be entire sermons in themselves, concepts such as election and faith and sanctification. 
However, in this series of messages, I plan to follow Peter's train of thought, rather than using his letter as a jumping off point for a more in-depth discussion of some of the topics he mentioned. But before we look at verse 10, we have to go back briefly to verses 8 and 9 from last week. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Notice in verse 8 that we love him, we believe in him, and we rejoice. The most important of these words is believe. I say that because believing in Jesus is the foundation of Christianity. I say that because love and rejoicing flow out of believing in Jesus. We love him because we believe in him. We rejoice because we believe in him. So believing in Jesus is at the heart of verse 8. Keeping that in mind, notice that in verse 9, the outcome of our faith, meaning the outcome of believing in Jesus, is the salvation of our souls. This was true of the Jewish Christians scattered throughout what is now Turkey. And it's true of us too. The outcome, or the result, of our believing in Jesus is the salvation of our souls. Let's continue now with verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. My message this morning is concerning this salvation, or about this salvation, meaning the salvation of our souls and of the souls of the Jews who were reading this letter. That's what Peter was writing about in the previous verse. But isn't salvation always about spiritual things, about our souls? If so, why would Peter make a point of mentioning that? Let's keep in mind that Peter was addressing Jewish believers. Most of them, maybe all of them, would have grown up with a different understanding of salvation. Like most Jews of that time, they would have been taught to expect a king from the line of David to ride into Jerusalem on horseback, leading a group of fighting men. He would stir up the crowds and then lead the people into battle against the Romans and throw off that yoke of oppression. So we can understand why Peter reminded them that he was talking about this salvation, the salvation of their souls. He was not talking about the salvation of the Jews from the army that was destroying their land, but rather salvation from the sin that was destroying their souls. From an earthly point of view, they were in bondage or slavery to Rome. From a heavenly point of view, from God's point of view, they were in bondage to sin. But what about us? We would call ourselves Christians, but what kind of salvation are we expecting from God? Are we expecting salvation from our earthly enemies, our earthly problems? Or are we expecting the salvation of our souls? If we are looking for G to Jesus for salvation, let's be clear about what kind of salvation he offers. Notice that Peter connected the salvation offered by Jesus to the writings of the prophets in the Old Testament. His point was that the prophets spoke and wrote about what God had planned. Concerning this salvation, Peter described it as the grace that would be theirs. He called it grace because so many of the Jews thought that they could earn God's favor by keeping the law. The Jewish leaders, typically, thought that they were doing pretty well so they thought they didn't need to be saved from sin. And it happens in our time too. There are people, perhaps even among those listening, who think they're doing pretty well. They see themselves as good people, so they don't really need saving from sin. They might even find this talk of sin to be offensive. The concept of grace begins with the fact that we aren't doing well, and so we cannot earn God's favor. We can only gratefully accept his favor. It is given, not earned. It is something to be thankful for, not something to be proud of. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we will not be showing off our good deeds. 
we will be pleading God's grace based on Jesus' blood offered as a sacrifice for our sins. Concerning this salvation, Peter said, grace would be yours, meaning this grace would be given to the Jews of those days, to the Jews to whom he was writing. Elsewhere, the New Testament makes it plain that those of us who are Gentiles benefit as well. God's plan of salvation is not limited to the Jews. However, since Peter was writing to Jews, he was making the point that this salvation had been part of God's plan for Israel for a very long time. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. How were these prophets of old prophesying? It was, according to Peter, by the Spirit of Christ. But what did he mean by the Spirit of Christ? When Scripture tells of someone speaking or writing by the inspiration of the Spirit, he is usually called the Holy Spirit. But here Peter speaks of the Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. And in Romans 8, Paul also speaks of the Spirit of God as the Spirit of Christ. So, although it's rare, it is legitimate to speak of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. Think of this. Jesus Christ had been born in Bethlehem about six decades before Peter wrote this letter. Yet Peter described the Spirit of Christ as inspiring the prophets when they prophesied, hundreds or even thousands of years before. Clearly, Peter didn't believe that Jesus was just another human whose life began at his birth only a few decades before. Instead, he believed that Jesus had already existed back in the days of the ancient prophets. Of course, John believed that too. In John chapter 1, he described Jesus as the Word, as the one who was God and who was in the beginning with God. This is important to our understanding of Jesus. Although he was a man like any other in so many ways because he was born into the human race, Jesus was also the eternal God. He was worthy of their worship, as he is worthy of our worship. The ancient prophets who wrote concerning this salvation wondered and inquired about how it would happen. Their inquiries focused on two questions, when and who. They knew that this salvation was future. Daniel, from his vision in chapter 2, might have recognized that it would happen during the Roman Empire. Many of the prophets prophesied about the coming of God's anointed Messiah. So they had some of the details, but would have dearly loved to know more. Peter continued writing about this salvation. He wrote that through the prophets, the Spirit of God had predicted the sufferings of Christ, the Messiah. I'll give one example this morning, Isaiah 53. In that chapter, written by the prophet Isaiah, the Jews were told about the suffering Messiah, the one who would die for the sins of the lost sheep. They had also predicted the glories of Jesus. I think there are several possibilities, all of which are true. When Jesus was raised from the dead, when Jesus was taken up into heaven, and when Jesus raised up for himself a church. In each of these situations, Jesus was glorified. But notice that our salvation is focused on Christ. The prophets had predicted the sufferings and glories of Christ. Peter wanted the readers to see clearly that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy about Jesus. It's easy to get bogged down in Old Testament prophecy. It may help us to remember that most Old Testament prophecies concern Israel and concern the Messiah. The prophecies about the Messiah have been fulfilled in part and will continue to be fulfilled by Jesus. The prophecies about Israel that have not been fulfilled already will be fulfilled in the Church of Jesus. Either way, we can see Jesus as the focus. But this points to another truth that we should know about the Old Testament. The Old Testament history, like the prophecies, is also focused on the Christ. Although many events that happened are told in detail, Running throughout the Old Testament are references and pictures and patterns that point to the Messiah, to Christ, to Jesus. 
it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. We might wonder how it could be revealed to the prophets that they were serving these dispersed Jews to whom Peter was writing. How did they even know about them? The prophets would have been thinking in general of descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They would be thinking of those who would be alive when the Messiah came, not these particular Jews as individuals. I mentioned Daniel's prediction that the Messiah would come during the time of the Roman Empire. But Daniel was shown part of what was to, be, of what was to come in a dream about a statue, not in a photo or a video. This is what was revealed to the prophets at some later date the Christ or Messiah would come, that he would suffer and then be glorified. When he came, he would bring salvation to the Jews. So the prophets were serving God's people, the Jews, by preparing them ahead of time to expect the Messiah, Christ, Jesus, who came to bring salvation. They had prophesied about the very things that had recently been announced to these Jews. And what was that? What had been announced or preached to these Jews of the dispersion was the good news. The good news is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. These things that were announced, this good news was preached to them by some people that Peter doesn't identify. Whoever they were, they were preaching the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. And these Jews of the dispersion, the ones Peter was writing to, repented of their sin and accepted the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross to save them from their sins. I hope we can see how all this works together. In verse 11, the Spirit had used the prophets to tell of Jesus, the Christ, ahead of time. So the Jews Peter was writing to had already had the Old Testament, which was inspired by the Spirit of God. And then in verse 12, the Spirit had used some preachers to tell them the good news about Jesus. We still have the Old Testament, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Although the first apostles who preached the gospel have long since gone to be with Jesus, I can preach from the New Testament that they left us. While my preaching is not inspired by the Holy Spirit, like those people mentioned in this verse, I can count on him to use his inspired word in my life and yours when I'm preaching from it. Let's take a step back and look at the big picture, as they say. Let's look at the whole story of the gospel. After Adam and Eve sinned, God announced that an offspring of Eve, speaking of Jesus, would crush the serpent, which is Satan. Later he called Abraham, promising him an offspring who would bless the whole world. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were ancestors of the nation of Israel. From that nation, God raised up King David, and from among David's descendants, he raised up Jesus to be the Messiah, the Christ. When that is all put together, it is an amazing history of events. But the most amazing part is that God did all this. He sent Jesus because he wanted to restore the relationship between himself and disobedient, sinful human beings. No wonder that the angels long to look into this. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It has often been said that when we see the word therefore, we need to ask what it is there for. This word, therefore, connects what Peter would write next with what he'd written already. Peter had given them a summary of how the gospel had been foretold by the ancient prophets, about how they had heard and received the message of the gospel, the message concerning salvation from sin. Therefore, Peter was saying, because of everything that he had just written concerning this salvation, here is what they're expected to do. They were expected to set their hope fully. Even before we look at what we're supposed to set our hope on, we can already see something important in this word fully. No matter at what stage we are at in our Christian walk, 
most of us can understand that it's the most important thing in our lives. In the here and now, we have forgiveness of sins, a restored relationship with the God who created us. We have peace of mind and confidence that he loves us no matter what is going on around us. Furthermore, we have the status of being elect, being chosen to represent Jesus and serve him in this world. Given all that, we're not meant to relegate Jesus to just a small corner of our lives, nor is he an add-on, something extra that we include in our lives to make things go better for us. We're not meant to have our hope resting partly on a comfortable home, a satisfactory income, a comfortable retirement, or our creature comforts, and partly on our faith. Whatever else God grants us in our lives, and many of us have been granted much, we are to have our hope fully on something else. Our hope is to be set on grace. We've talked about grace as what God has already done for us that we don't deserve. How God in Christ has showered his love upon us. How he has purchased our salvation, our forgiveness, our freedom from sin. But I think that here Peter is focusing on another aspect of our hope, the future. At some time in the future, Jesus will be revealed. But in what sense? Hasn't he already been revealed? To those who believe, yes. But like us, these believers were encouraged to expect the second coming of Jesus. The day is coming when Jesus will step back into this world and every eye will see him. There's coming a day when everyone will recognize him for who he is. The dedicated believer will recognize him. The so-so believer will recognize him. The unbeliever will recognize him along with those who hate his name. The king will return. That's the final aspect of the grace we're talking about. Peter is telling them to look ahead to the future. Peter didn't know when that end would come. For most people since then, the end comes for them when they die physically. It's personal. But one day God will end everything here on earth as Jesus is revealed from heaven. This becomes another reason to set our hope fully on the grace of God. But setting your hope on the grace of God is the action that we are to take. Peter also tells us how we're to go about doing that. What comes first? First, we are to be preparing our minds for action. And second, we are to be sober-minded. Peter exhorted his readers and us to prepare their minds for action. What did he mean? I think that we are doing at least some of that right now as we study the Bible and as we think about spiritual matters. Peter also urges them to be sober-minded. According to Rogers and Rogers, the Greek word includes self-control and clarity of mind. According to Benson, it has the meaning of watchful. The New International Version said, keep a clear head. And the Good News Translation said, keep alert. None of these sounds particularly enjoyable, so why would we? Because we're still tempted by sin. Two examples come to my mind. Years ago, I heard TV described as the plug-in drug. During the past week, I heard a CBC report about addiction to the Internet. These things hold our attention and take our time, but they can also dull the mind and the conscience and keep us from being alert. We need to prepare our minds for action so that we will be able to set our hope fully on the grace that will be revealed to us in Jesus. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Peter was telling them to act as obedient children. This is a picture, of course. They were literally adults. But they were spiritually part of the family of God. God is their father. They were to act as obedient children. This means that they would not be willful, but cooperative with their Heavenly Father. This is a picture of what we're to be as well. Like children, we won't always understand why the Father has certain expectations of us, why he wants us to reject this behavior and embrace that behavior, but we're still expected to act as obedient children. In what way were they to be obedient? They were not to be conformed to their passions. 
The Greek word translated as passions could also be translated as desires. In 1 John 2.16, we read about the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. Because this was in ancient times, some of the things they wanted would be different than what we might want. But just as in our day, people would desire fine clothing and jewelry, they would enjoy the pleasures of good food, and just as in our day, sexual desires were a big part of the culture. To be conformed is to be shaped by something. Jesus said, we are defiled by what comes out of us, what comes out of our hearts. Peter told these Jews and us that they were not to allow their desires from within to shape them, to shape their behavior. They were not to be conformed to their passions. We live in a post-Christian era in which people are encouraged to be or do whatever they want to be or do. So people are encouraged to express their appetites or desires, including their sexual appetites or desires. Instead, they were to be shaped by and conform to God's expectations of them. And that's true of us as well. What was their former ignorance? Both Jews and proselytes would be acquainted with the law, although the Jews would have grown up with it and so probably have a much greater knowledge. So in what way would they be ignorant? There's ignorance and there's willful ignorance. The Greek word may refer to either. So it's possible that they'd been deliberately ignoring the moral and ethical teachings of the law, or it's possible they'd been simply unaware that the law was meant to be applied even to the desires of the heart, as Jesus pointed out. Either way, Paul warns them not to be conformed to or shaped by their passions in the way that they lived before. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. But God who called you is holy, so be holy in all conduct. In other words, there should not be a corner of our lives from which we exclude God. We cannot consider ourselves obedient children if there is some area where we are disobedient. There are those in our society who claim to be excused from certain Christian moral teachings because they have impulses that are different from most people. But the truth is that all of us have impulses which are not godly. And if we are Christians, we are expected to be obedient in all our conduct. In order to make his point, Peter quotes from Leviticus 11, You shall be holy because I am holy. Let's think about that. We are to be holy because God is holy. Not because we will be happier in the long run. Not because we will be healthier and safer. Not because people will like us better. Not because we will leave behind a legacy of good character. Those things are all good. Those things may or may not be true in our lives. But we are called to be holy because our God is holy. God has done something amazing for us in Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross for us, we who believe are saved from our sin, saved for an eternal life in his presence. Since God himself is without sin, we should not be surprised that he wants us to be without sin in his presence. And so Peter tells us that we are expected to be holy as he is holy. That's his character, and that's the character he expects of us. We're made in his image, made to reflect his character, his image, to the world. Let's be the kind of Christians others can recognize as followers of Jesus, because they see in us the character of God. Shall we pray? Holy Father, we ask that you would give us a desire to be holy and also the power to be holy. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who died to take away our sin. Amen. Today's closing hymn is Cleanse Me.
Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.